Hey there, everyone. Welcome back to See It, Stop It, Tackling Abuse in Amateur Sports, presented by the Foundation for Global Sports Development and Sidewinder Films. Uh, this event is designed to empower coaches, parents, athletes, and administrators to recognize and prevent abuse. Uh, as we know, sports should be safe and secure and every little person that uh, wants to make a contribution all the way up through amateur athletics and, and possibly your future Olympic career should be um, stepping stones of security all the way up the ladder. Uh, if you weren't able to attend our previous session from prevention to solutions, the recording will be available for viewing on globalsportsdevelopment.org. So we had um, a, a panel uh, discussion that I thought was really robust. Um, our final panel resources and Q&A will summarize resources mentioned throughout the event and allow you to ask any pressing questions you may have that have come up within the last two days. So for those of you that have been with us the whole time, uh, I think this will be a great opportunity to summarize and walk away even with some action items. Uh, remember that like any of our discussions, uh, there's a chance for some triggering even in our questioning. So uh, we encourage you to practice some self-care. Uh, feel free to anonymously call or text Child Helps Hotline at 1-800-422-4453 if you need any immediate help. Uh, Child Help has been working with Global Sports for close to eight years reached over 160,000 kids, coaches, and parents with Child Help Speak Up Be Safe for Athletes underwritten by Foundation for Global Sports Development. And I've really seen uh, it practiced in a classroom, in a sports camp where children have come forward right in the middle of receiving these life-saving tools. So that's the hope in, in prevention, that we create safer spaces and we also give children an opportunity to find their voice all the way up from the littlest athlete, again, to that collegiate athlete, to that high school athlete, to that um, potential, you know, former uh, NFL player like Jonathan Vaughn or like the gymnast that we saw. Um, so if you have any questions, please enter them using the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen and we'll be happy to answer. Uh, I'm Daphne Young. I've worked as an investigative journalist, department head in at-risk education, and I've been at Child Help for 11 years, uh, and I work on our senior leadership team as chief communications officer to help set strategy and vision for the work that we do nationwide. Uh, joining me today is Tracy Leonard. Tracy owns Safe Spaces, which is a consulting firm that helps create safe spaces for everyone through workshops, through trainings, and through environmental and policy scans. She is also a darkness to light authorized facilitator. I've taken this training and it's so great. And she's a certified instructor. She's trained over 1,500 adults in child sexual abuse prevention and over 200 new facilitators and was recently named Darkness to Light 2021 Instructor of the Year. So congratulations for that, Tracy. And I would love to hear, just you know, start our discussion with a little background on your work and your organization. Sure, thank you. Yeah, it was, it was quite an honor um, at the Ignite Conference this year to, um, to receive that. And um, especially after the year we've had, trying to continue prevention efforts virtually and trying to deliver training um, virtually in a way that still maintains the fidelity of the Darkness to Light program and the Stewards of Children curriculum because it is so, um, it's just, it's demonstrated to you know, show behavior changes and, um, you know, action that, that people take. So um, that is part of what um, I do with um, my safe spaces. Um, is really delivering that training and, and other training um, related to um, family dynamics, positive parenting, um, ACEs, trauma, resiliency is another big area. I know it was talked a lot about yesterday. Um, and so that is a, a way that I'm able to reach even wider audiences, um, especially educators. I find myself as a former teacher and school principal kind of continuing to go back to that education world um, where I feel that I can continue to make an impact even though I'm not directly in the classroom or in the building 
The other thing that I do, and, and I, you know, Ruth will have some questions or can talk about it too, is um, environmental scans and policy scans to really take a look at your organization, whatever it is, and um, changes that you can begin to make to become not only trauma-informed um, coaching, which again was one of the discussions yesterday, but uh, like how your environment can be trauma-informed and, and physically um, impactful and, um, you know, and, and help your athletes and, and any of the, the kids that you're working with or any of the adults and survivors who might be, um, you know, still an active part of, of the work that you're doing. And I don't think people realize how important um, just an environmental scan can be in preventative factors. I, I worked with a woman who worked with the diocese and she uh, was really working actively on um, child sexual abuse and, and creating environments where it is virtually impossible for anybody to be in, in a location alone with a child without checks and balances. And she would go in and it was things that um, you wouldn't think about as you just walk in an mm -hmm. environment like, hey, this has blinds that you can close. This window should be open here. This door should be open. These eaves are hanging a little low. Somebody could take a child behind this and hide. They started opening up all the spaces and started seeing the numbers go down in terms of what, what was being reported because mm -hmm. that environmental scan, like you say, in the policy scan um, creates less opportunity for those that are predatory. And sometimes predatory folks move on to other places where they have greater opportunity or option because they're seeing somebody so actively, like I'm watching your space, I'm watching your, your paperwork, everything is being looked at. Um, you know, I people often mock, I, I have noticed when I talk about, you know, creating a safer environment because people often mock safe spaces as if it's some kind of like everyone gets a trophy philosophy. And so when you talked about trauma-informed spaces, I wonder if you can just impress upon people the great urgency of creating that trauma-informed space. Why is it so important? Yeah, I think it's, well, you, you want even your athletes or anybody coming into your space right when they pull into the parking lot to to feel safe not to let their guard down but to feel safe so you want to make sure you have well lit areas and the parking is well lit um, you want to make sure that there are policies in place for um, entry into the building um, if it is key card or access code or it's locked during certain hours if the front office isn't, you know, the front reception area isn't maintained. And then you want simple things like um, light, <laughs> you know, uh, sunlight it, as much as you can. And, you know, there are some tricks and you can certainly Google, you know, making trauma informed spaces, but you can, you can add mirrors as a way to kind of reflect the light and to provide more light, simply adding plants, um, the way you have your furniture situated um, or uh, the kinds of furniture that you have. Uh, do you have, as you mentioned, I recently did an environmental scan at Woodward West um, here in California, and they had a little room in one of their, um, in, well, it wasn't a little room, it was in the, their gigantic um, skateboard indoor um, hangar that they call it. And there was an office space and it did it had windows, which was great, but then they had blinds. And it was like, well, you shouldn't need to have those blinds there. R just get rid of them. Don't even, you know, that shouldn't even be a, a, a concern. So that openness is such an important part of having a trauma-informed space. The colors you choose, there's little things. Yeah. Um, it's not an end-all be all and it should never replace you know that you check check these things off and okay now you know we're not going to have any abuse because that's not going to happen but those are just some little things that people can continue to do to um, make their um, their athletes safer their visitors safer their coaching staff safer anybody who is you know a part of these um, 
buildings and that are coming into you. you. You want that feeling. And those are just a few things that you can do. I think that's great. And, and when you also, when you make it an intention for your organization, I think people feel it and, and it's survivors who may be working for you, who maybe never even come forward. When you create that more soothing environment, when you create that more collaborative feel, when you are protective, I think there's a lot of healing that can happen in those spaces. So not only are you just preventing problems, but you're also creating places where people feel like they can bring more of their best because they're not feeling, you know, all of the um, kind of aggression that certain kind of spaces can can stir up some of the anxiety. That's right. Stressors. That's right. Even um, one thing that I found on a scan I did recently um, in a gymnastics gym was all of the apparatus and all of the, um, the, the, the mats and the big foam pieces that they had, when they were not in use on the floor, they were stacked against the wall and there was a picture, there was a photograph of what it should look like. So if anybody was taking things out and putting them back in, it needed to be in this specific way so that there weren't hiding spots. There, you know, kids weren't able to make a fort or a tunnel, you know, like the younger students, it, it was safe, it was against the wall, it was, you know, there was just no, not, no way to get around it. Right. And I think thinking about those things too, those uh, visual images that you can have within your spaces make a big difference, um, just to have that visual cue and reminder of what it looks like when it's where, when it's not in use, when we're not using the equipment and how to put great. it back. Yeah. And, and, and a child who will just see it as an organizational tool may never know that this is done for my protection. Exactly. But it's a great way to just um, make those spaces better for the little ones and, and all right. the way the line. Um, and, you know, we have that in our doctor's offices, right? From, from when I was a child to now, uh, we've changed those spaces. Now you do have that nurse. You do have that second person. No one just shuts a door and does an exam at, or shouldn't uh, in our modern time. Um, let's look at how we can share uh, local and national resources because you have, um, mm -hmm. I, I love uh, Darkness to Light training. I love Stewards of Children. Um, how can the audience get trained or certified even if they want to take it a step further? Sure. Um, yeah, I encourage anybody. It's two hours. I mean, there's no reason to not give two hours of your time to learn practical tips and tricks to um, prevent child sexual abuse from happening. So going to the um, d2l.org website, you can look up and see if anybody locally is having an in-person training. Um, with everything coming out of the pandemic, a lot of people are going back to in-person trainings and having it um, you know, be appropriate for their county or their jurisdiction and, and health guidelines. Uh, but you can also take it online. Um, you can either take it virtually with a facilitator um, or you can take it uh, in an online format and, you know, kind of watch the video, answer some questions as you go through to kind of check for understanding. Uh, but again, two hours is, is nothing to give up to prevent a lifetime of trauma for the children in our lives, whatever, whoever they are. Um, and the great thing too with Darkness to Light in the curriculum is then there are some little sub modules that you can take. So if you really liked the stewards of children, but you want to know more as a, as a coach about healthy touch for children and youth, there's a small module that you can take. It's a, it's a little shorter, it's about 35 minutes, um, watches a little bit of a video, but it really delves into how to um, have healthy touch interactions and what that looks like and also what is not healthy. And it, also talks a little bit too about um, normal sexual development, which is a really important thing to consider in all of this and could certainly raise some flags if um, you noticed a child under your tutelage was, you know, saying things or doing things that were not developmentally appropriate, you know, sexually for their age. So it's just, it's great. And I, I really encourage anybody to, you know, to take the training. <laughs> And I, I would say absolutely. I, I it's and it's a straightforward, very easy, um, very engaging training. And 
Um, you don't have to be in this field. Um, I've, I've told people, even if you're not a mandated reporter, become one of the heart, like become somebody that cares about your community that says, I have two hours to go online or show up at a training. I like the live because you, you get that interaction with the facilitator. If you get someone yeah. like Tracy, you're going to get yeah. your questions answered. Um, but, you know, to springboard on something you were just talking about, Tracy, we did get um, an audience question in and um, it relates to, you know, when you were discussing the mats and all the little games that people could put together to create a little fort in a very short amount of time, um, there could be an incident of peer-to-peer -peer abuse. Absolutely. And so the audience question was, um, can you address sports and peer athlete abuse and how we make those, you know, those situations, how we address yeah, them? Yeah, that's really, yeah. I mean, we estimate, and by we, darkness to light, and and well, and more than that, any of the data and research that's out there that uh, forty percent of sexual abuse is happening between is peer to peer. So an older, more powerful youth to younger, um, in particular. So you really do need to set up um, particular uh, policies and. Within your organizations for you know showering, you know if there's a locker room at the end and you've got a wide age range that you have the older children and the younger children, you know they're they're separate. Um, you do need to make sure you know a rule of three is a great rule to have that it's never one on one because that's another statistic as we know eighty more than eighty percent of sexual abuse happens in a one on one isolated incident, and whether that is with an adult or a peer, you have to eliminate those one-on-one -on -one instances. So, you know, having that rule of three, whether it's two adults and a child or, you know, three children, you need to, that needs to just be something that is, you know, it, that's, that's what we do here. That's what we do at this gym. What's what we do at this practice. And um, we need adults to really be looking and monitoring, you know, if it is a kind of a, a free gym time or a studio or everybody's doing their own thing, the coaches and the staff need to not be, you know, talking off to the side. They need to actively be, you know, checking the, um, the back rooms, the locker rooms, all of the physical environment, both inside and outside, just to do, you know, kind of these continual checks and to make sure that they're making it as safe as they possibly can. You know, it's such an interesting point you bring up because we are, we're kind of having this battle legislatively um, in residential care where we are trying to explain in our little cottages, for example, you have several kids in a very large uh, room, but it is precisely um, because we are getting severely abused children, uh, sexually abused children coming in. And if you put two children who have been harmed in this way together, um, some of the acting out, some of the aggressions that are possible, um, you know, that we're trying to create that safety so that there's uh, constant monitoring, there's camera monitoring, there's, there's uh, walking around money, but also the children being together, um, not giving them those isolated opportunities to be behind someone's back. I think that's so essential and people don't realize the importance of, you know, when I tell people signing up for summer sports camps, I always say, make sure there is more than one counselor to a bunk. Mm -hmm. Don't trust the one bunk, one, you know, and, and let's look at what makes a safer camp. Um, Make sure there's a buddy system where kids are paired up. Uh, ideally, as you say, in rules of threes, um, make sure that there is a prevention program at the camp, right? That they're, that they're teaching the kids body safety and the, the instructor's body safety so that the environment itself says, this is something we care about. And I find that such a challenge because a lot of people, and I'm sure as a facilitator and as, as a trainer, you know that, um, it's almost like people want to say, ooh, this is a, this topic, and we don't want to say it happened. You know, we have a good club here, uh, Tracy. I appreciate what you do. It's probably great for other area, at-risk areas. You know, how do you break through that wall and say, no, everyone, you need it? <laughs> yeah, that's so funny. When, because I am also an instructor in, tr in trained facilitators, that's one of the questions that we tackle in our, our training, that kind of that resistance, like, what do you say if somebody says, it's, it's not a problem here, we don't need your training. 
And we always say to come back to them with some of the statistics that 90% of children are sexually abused by their 18th birthday. You know, the one-on-one -on -one statistic, the youth statistics, all of those numbers, you, you cannot repudiate that. But you can also say, we're not saying, you know, anything bad is happening, but wouldn't you rather be proactive? Wouldn't you rather have an environment um, you know, that has a, a seal of approval, so to speak, that, you know, the whole staff here is trained in stewards of children or, you know, whatever curriculum it might be. Um, and, and parents want their kids to come there and that you have that continual, you know, source to set your, um, your summer camp or whatever up for success. It's just, um, we need to help people reframe their thinking and think of it in that light and and what the impact could be if something happened and and it might not be also that it happened at your facility or your camp it could have happened to a child at home but if your campers your camping staff or your um, you know your coaches and staff are able to responsibly react if a child discloses to them that's part of that training too. So, you know, a child might not feel that they can, you know, say anything at home or even to a teacher, but they might have that relationship with their coach and they're ready to open up. Um, but if a coach or staff doesn't know how to respond and what to do with that information, that can be just as harmful as the abuse that had happened. The child could be re-traumatized. They could never say anything again because nobody believes them. So that's part of what, you know, a good abuse, a prevention curriculum will do is prepare you to respond wherever it might happen to a child, not just at your site. A hundred percent. That's such a great point. And also that I think a lot of people through the training process have the opening of eyes. Um, I, I uh, run a group called the Arizona Child Sexual Abuse and Exploitation Prevention Coalition. It's a mouthful, but it's a, a group of agencies that all kind of come together and uh, try to strategize uh, for our state. And one of the um, colleagues I have does nurses training. So um, he goes in and he trains nurses and doctors in hospital facilities about um, sex trafficking and what that looks like. And, and he began, he said, almost always, they say, I, we're so glad we're going to learn more about this. You know, we don't really see this in our hospital, but we'll keep our eyes open for it. You know, we, we definitely want this information. And it's, I think it's great you're doing this. By the end of the training, he's like, they're dropping jaw, yep. picking jaws off the floor because suddenly they realize, so that's what that tattoo meant. So that's what that interaction could have been. They reflect on things that maybe hit their gut in a funny way that now are hitting their brain in a trained way to understand that I think I have seen it. I think I've been around sex trafficking mm -hmm. and just not understood what I saw. So right. Um, even if you're out there and you have an institution that you feel is pretty darn solid, um, once you're trained, your eyes are opened in a new way. And it also helps you to be that person, um, even as, as Tracy was saying, that recognizes the, the child with the head down. Uh, hey, how are you doing? Fine. I'm okay. And, and to be that person that asks one or two more questions. You know, it seems like you're having a tough day and doesn't just let it go because you've got 20 other kids to worry about and you take those extra steps that give a child a chance to disclose, to come forward. Absolutely. So, that's amazing. Um, so definitely get this training if you haven't been trained. Um, and I want, before we answer a few more questions, I do want to make sure we get some of these resources out um, so that people can uh, get the training that they need. Mm -hmm. So, um, the Foundation for Global Sports Development has partnered with a bunch of organizations, including ours, and um, most of which have been mentioned during the symposium. Uh, we're going to put up a slide, I believe, that will give you some of the resources, um, and they'll also be in the chat uh, moving forward. So um, Avalon Healing Center at avalonhealing.org, Army of Survivors, you know, we talked about the armies of enablers in one of our uh, one of our panels, and boy, nobody wants to be part of that army. Uh, but we definitely want to be part of Army of Survivors, and that's at army the army of survivors .org. Um, Child help, uh, my org is childhelp.org. Uh, 
Child Help U uh, Child USA, childusa.org, Darkness to Light Stewards of Children. I like this one because it's easy. D2L.org uh, backslash get, get slash trained. And again, that'll be in um, the chat as well. And um, so I wanted to look at some of the other questions um, that folks are having specific to the topics that we've been going over uh, for the last two days. You mentioned a little bit about how coaches could create safer environments. Um, what are some safety tips for traveling sports teams uh, when you're on the road? Uh, Jonathan Vaughn talked about how his mother would always ask like, where are you staying? What you eating? What you doing? Uh, she didn't even ask about the game first. She wanted to know where <laughs> Son, where is this? Where is this guy going to be? I want my boy taken care of. And so, uh, what are some safety tips for um, for traveling sports teams? Yeah. Oh, I think that's a great point that that he made as well. And and we do need to bring the parents into this conversation and even make them a part of the training, whatever we might be doing um, institutionally. Parents can be great allies. They can do some of that. Um, groundwork, so to speak, because with traveling teams, one of the things I really think you need to know is you may have created a safe environment where your team is now, but where they're going might not be that way. So ask those questions, um, you know, coach to coach, staff to staff, or parent, you know, that's a great, um, you know, if you've got that go-getter parent who's looking for something to do, put them on that task. Let them call and figure out what you know the the safety situations are what the locker room situation looks like you know send me pictures what is the um the hotel are we staying at what kind of accommodations are whatever it might be um know where you're going so you can do a little um you know groundwork or not groundwork but you can do a little prep work before you get there. So you can anticipate potential um, situations that, add, that might happen that you think you've got a good handle on, but you just don't know because you don't know um, the staff necessarily on the other end and who it's gonna be. So, and then you also, you need to have really concrete um, policies and codes of conduct. Um, you know, that rule of three, um, making sure the students realize and you're, you're kids realize it, it's not just at our place, it's anywhere we go. Um, you know, if you're traveling by bus or by plane, that you have adults kind of um, smattered throughout, you know, no one, no adults like to sit in the back of the bus with the kids, you know, let's face it, but you need to, you need to stagger yeah. them throughout so that they've got eyes and they can see. Um, again, that the point with um, peer to peer, you know, you really need to be aware of that. And so if, if it is a travel and it's, it's long distance travel, you know, you're, you are staying the night, you need to have really clear, um, guidelines and policies about who's in the hotel rooms, how many numbers, what, um, you know, are we locking the doors and locking them in and putting tape over it at the end of the night? So we, you know, we see that, do we have a parent positioned or a staff member positioned in the, the lobby, in the hallway, um, all of those things you, you do, you really just need to put some effort into thinking, how can we make this as safe as pos as we possibly can? Um, and so I think doing all of that, especially for the other group that you may not be as familiar with, that, and you had mentioned it before, it raises the awareness that we're a group, we care about our kids, we are watching, we are, you know, we have eagle eyes on everything and don't mess with us. Don't, you know, don't try because it's, it's not, it's not going to work. We're going to be watching. I like that when predators are prowling around, don't mess with us because the, right. the anti predators, the anti enablers, the anti bystanders right. are, are going to let you know ahead of time that we've got That's our right. eyes on you. Uh, it's that old move from meet the parents right. watching you. Um, yeah. And you know, uh, 
I think when you consider all of the different places, all of the areas of potential risk, everyone from the bus driver to the uh, helping parent to every single, to somebody working at the hotel, every, there's so many places that there can be risk. And I think one of the most essential things we try to get across when we're going into schools and doing um, our Child Up Speak Be Safe work is trying to um, give children also such a sense of what body safety is, what, um, how to come forward when someone's hurt you, how nothing that a person does is your fault, but here's how you can get somebody to help you. Everything from describing the icky feeling in your stomach all the way through to, um, you know, ways to come forward and, and role playing some of that. And I think, you yes. know, when you're a parent, having that tough conversation and saying, you know, so many people in this world love you, but there are people they're not good people that don't love you, that don't know you and could do bad things. And that this is what, this is how it could be. And when you role play a little bit with your kid, when you try out, um, you know, we've seen some of those hidden tape shows that have stopped our hearts where uh, Chris Hansen will have kids on a playground that have been trained and then somebody will go and say exactly the line, can you help me find my puppy and watch mm -hmm. the child go into a van. So it's, it's reinforcement as well as just that initial training in the same way that people who are trained in darkness to light do need that reinforcement of regular um, boosters in a sense to be ready mm -hmm. for what's going on. Um, I have another audience question. Um, our, oh, this is a good one because as, as uh, those of us that are parents, you know, you want to give your child a little more freedom as they become teens. And uh, the question is, are prevention strategies different for teenage athletes and child athletes? Um, yes. Oh, well, I think at the heart of it, they are the same. Um, and I know we like to think of prevention in a, in a couple ways that there's primary prevention and secondary prevention. Um, you know, you think about kids uh, in a river, you know, and they're drowning, they're having trouble swimming. Well, your instinct is to go and to pull them out and to help rescue them. Um, but we want that primary prevention where we go to where they're jumping in in the first place and figure out why they're doing it, what's happening, how do we stop it? So I think all along you want that. And if you are instilling those um, prevention strategies with your younger ones, you are setting up an environment, even if a student moves, you know, across town or goes to, you know, they're at a different club or, or whatever it might be, you've already instilled in them some, some ground rules and they're going to start asking, well, why don't you do this? Why, you know, why doesn't this door lock or, or how come we only have to have two people? And, and they start becoming advocates for themselves. I think it definitely needs to be um, developmentally appropriate too, depending on right. um, whatever it might be, you know, you know, you get to those preteens and teens and the conversations are going to be a little, a little different. Um, you know, you, you've got hormones, you've got other things going on. And so you do need to think, think about that. Um, but I think the underlying prevention, um, you know, really is, is the same. It's that, um, trauma-informed coaching, it's the trauma-informed space, it's the continual training um, of staff, volunteers, um, refreshers, environmental scans, all of that is prevention training that does need to happen across. But where those little nuances come in is exactly um, that role-playing thing, the what if you know, it, when you can ask your team, well, what if we get here and this is happened? Or what if this happens to you? And to get them to think through that on their own and come up with the language on their own, then they are more likely to react the way you want them to if they're ever put into the position. So I think some things like that might be a little more nuanced. And then I really do think at some point, um, you know, 15, 16 years old, you let them take, you know, the darkness to light stewards of children training. You let them in on the prevention curriculum. Um, 
we, I always say whenever I've done it for um, camp counselors who are, you know, high school students or, you know, first year of college, um, if they're a certain age, I like to get parent permission to let them know what they're going to be watching. Um, but otherwise, it, it can be part of that, um, just that culture of your, of your team, where, you know, they, they, again, they reach a certain age, and they're kind of let, I don't want to say let into the secret, but they, you know, where they're able to digest that information more. And so I think that is another place where we would see um, you know, prevention efforts being a little bit different between the two, between the two age groups. No, I think that's great. And I like the way that actually our agencies work together in many ways, because um, I think we both share uh, a philosophy that, hey, it is not that child's job to stick up for themselves. And so what you describe from the child to the teen is really the growth of empowerment um, mm -hmm. to where you can give your teen that next launching step to adulthood that is that empowerment and I agree fully um, we're very um, careful about you know pre-k through, through the early years having just age appropriate uh, conversations but always keeping it as part as of their part. growth curriculum so that by the time they do have that chance to be a teen and have a little more freedom they are more empowered to be uh, careful and to be safe and uh, to at least have those lines of communication open with parents to be able to come forward if something happens. And okay. um, well, we are almost coming to, uh, unfortunately, the end of this discussion. I But I wonder if you had any um, kind of last words you'd like to leave with, uh, with our, the, the folks that have been listening in. Uh. Yeah, I, I would just say, um, whether you know you're a mandated reporter or not, and if you don't, you can certainly find out on any of, of the websites and the, and the resources that um, have been provided. Um, we all have a moral obligation to protect children. Um, and if we don't take that seriously, we're really, we're not gonna, we're not gonna make change. We're not gonna see, uh, we're gonna see more you know, institutional abuse, more family abuse. It, it's just, it's not going to end. We need to take risks. We need to put ourselves out there. Um, we need to speak up as adults. We are the ones who can change policy. We are the ones, as Amos said, we can go and we can testify, you know, before, you know, governments all over the world. It's not the children. So we we need to do that. And, and we also need to model that behavior for for our kids too, that um, to speak up, to say something. Um, when it happens, if it's after it happens, you know, we as adults need to be prepared to, um, to handle that as well. And we need to be able to react responsibly, um, you know, get that child help, let them know it's not their fault. And, um, if we as a, you know, adults or, or coaching staff, you know, can learn from those mistakes, maybe have to change a policy, but we need to have that growth mindset in it as well so that we are always um, adapting. You know, you, you do read, read up on being trauma-informed, read up on adverse childhood experiences, know that just because a child is is acting out or is um, bad or you know is as defiant there's probably a, a reasoning for that and so try to figure that out ask some open-ended questions get to know the child a little bit and and kind of get to the heart of what what that behavior is and you might it might be nothing but it could be, it could be something and um, our kids deserve it. A hundred percent and the power of one voice. And you brought up the greatest um, piece of this that I hadn't considered until I'm sitting here right now. Uh, not only does that one voice um, take advocacy on behalf of a potential victim, but that little person watching you from across the room has now learned that not only uh, do I know what to do when I see something like this in the future? But I'm safe with this person. Like my mom or dad calls when they see another little kid that's hurt. 
I'm going to be a safe little kid. And when I grow up, or even when I'm a peer to another little kid who's hurt, I'm going to come over and I'm going to say, hey, my friend is hurting. And that's what creates cultural shifts and changes. It's one household to one household, and then the community envelops it and it keeps going. And then you start getting better people getting into these institutions who are raised in trauma-informed environments and create trauma-informed institutions where guys like Jonathan and our brave gymnast and many of the folks who spoke uh, during this two-day panel yes. um, yeah. feel safe and feel right. nurtured and heard. So uh, mm -hmm. thank you, Tracy, for making the world a little safer. Uh, <laughs> it is a great value to communities that you serve uh, and check out what they do. It's, it's really wonderful. Thank you to um, our heroes at uh, Foundation for Global Sports Development and Sidewinder Films for all their award-winning work. Uh, we hope that you all feel equipped with the knowledge to ask questions, um, to prevent abuse, to continue exploring resources. Uh, we appreciate you taking the time over the last couple of days to learn more about these important topics. And together, uh, I believe we can create spaces that help athletes uh, feel safer. And um, let's be bold and even take it a step further and say, and with that, stop abuse in sports. Thank you to all.